Okay, we now uh, introduce Jenny. Uh, Jenny, actually, I want to quickly say, is uh, from the Project Factory, who's also worked uh, in augmented reality uh, from way back. Um, in fact, the first time I heard about augmented reality uh, at a conference was from Jennifer. So uh, please put your hands together. Uh, we're about to hear an amazing talk. Uh, no slides. Sorry, um, I figure you've got enough to look at with the rest of the people here. Uh, I've been building um, AR apps really since about 2009. I've just checked was the first one that we ever submitted to the store. The last one we submitted to the store was for the Blinky Bill, Bill film that's just come out now. So we're still doing it. The thing that I find really interesting in this space is the creative process of it. Now, we're storytellers, and the storytelling, when you start to deal with AR and VR, is something very, very different. And it's interesting, I think, that we're going to see these things play out differently. So I'm going to talk from a storyteller's perspective for a moment. So to me, the whole VR experience is a really immersive one. It's like picking up a specialised game controller and going into a quiet room and having a great time with your three screens around you while you're playing your favourite immersive first person, whatever it is, game. But I think that AR is going to have a role where we kind of like, we dip into it, like casual gaming, like when you want to play Angry Birds for two minutes or you want to have just a, a little dip at something in a, a bus stop while you're waiting there. And I think AR is going to be a little tool that we use. It will pull up to, to augment things and give us an answer and tell us what we want. But simply by the fact that it's not worn, AR is going to have a different level of immersion. And I go back sometimes and I think people have been augmenting the world for hundreds of years. How long have we had eyeglasses around for? So any of us who wear glasses are effectively augmenting our own reality by actually refocusing it in the way that we want. So I kind of see that as an extension of it. And, and some of us have got contact lenses. So I'm really interested in the idea that we'll get to the point where we've got AR or VR glasses and contact lenses, but we've got to think about this solution or, or experience that happens with VR where you've got to be isolated from it. And so I think there's this question about when do you want to be isolated from the world and when do you want the world to engage with you? And these are going to become the questions that we deal with. So some of the things that we're seeing already that we know are, we know that AR and VR are not vaporware. They've been around for, for 10 years or more. I mean, we're seeing them particularly in things of heads-up display in industry where they're looking at them in mechanics and in medicine. I've actually gone through and done a simulation where using a whole VR experience, I've been able to go in there and look at doing an operation on somebody, being able to move around the organs and see what's important and what's vital to cut or move or, or where, the, where the tumour might be. And I think those are the things that kind of like show the use of it in those specialised areas where the ability to move around an object virtually becomes critically important. But I also think, too, we're going to see it come up more in the play. So thinking particularly of the fact that Westpac, our, our host for this evening, where does, where does AR and VR sit in there when you're talking about a bank? Well, the Commonwealth Bank played with it where you could, you could hold up your phone and it would use your GPS and it would augment the house that you were looking at to tell you what the price of it was and whether it could be bought. And that was a clever little device, clever little tool, a clever little augmentation that let you have something extra from an app. It didn't have to augment it. It could have just given you the details using GPS, but they chose to make it visual. But I think when we get to the point where we're wearing regularly these displays that are able to give us the information at choice, that becomes very different. And if we then add millennials to it, you start to think, OK, I don't want to go into a bank and wait to see somebody. I don't have enough time. So how are you going to give me a virtual person that I can really respond to and have a relationship with and do it personally and on my own time and any time of day? And this gets into the area that I'm finding really fascinating. Some of the other work we do is in artificial intelligence. So let's start taking artificial intelligence agents and let's start taking some of the face simulation work that's coming out of the University of Auckland and particularly Mark Sagar who you might know won an Oscar for the work that he did on King Kong and Avatar and who is constructing human faces and right now if you stand at Auckland Airport you can have a long dialogue with a constructed face in whatever language you want that uses an artificial intelligence system behind it and facial stimulation. So let's take that to the customer service level and suddenly I can have a banking representative in any language I want or a customer service representative and I can have them in my lounge room and I can sit them down and talk to them and I can actually have a personalised experience with a personal banker even if all I've got is $20, $20 in the bank. And I think this is going to change the way that we expect customer service to be delivered to us. And I'm really fascinated by this idea of what, where you can take this. Two projects that we've worked on in the past we worked on a project where we used an artificial intelligence agent to be a woman who didn't know that her husband was dead 
and knew the doctor had to go in and break the news to her. And we did it as a project to teach doctors better communication skills. Now, I would love to have put that in a VR environment, but we didn't have the funding for it. So it was just a constructed environment. But imagine one of Mark's faces with our AI system, with our AI system behind it in a VR environment where the doctor is actually facing somebody having, doing this news. And it's interesting, we use the same AI and the same system to put you in front of a serial killer in a drama where there were eight people who were going to die unless you could get inside the serial killer's head and actually bond with him enough so he would tell you how to save them. The interesting thing was we presented both of these concepts at a simulation conference where I saw more VR and AR in health and, and, and military than I've ever seen before. And it didn't really surprise me that all the medical people were really interested in breaking bad news and how to get doctors to be better communicators. And all the military people were really interested in the suspect because they thought it was a great way of teaching interrogation techniques. Um, so it's an interesting world that we're stepping into now. I think that we're going to see a lot of failures in the business world to begin with. We're going to see a lot of experiments there. But in the same way that we kind of, we remember the Marshall McLuhan, we drive into the future looking in the rear vision mirror and we put radio on TV and then we put TV and magazines on the internet and then we put the internet on mobile phones until we got apps and we're going to do the same thing with VR and AR. We're going to take all that stuff that we know from all those other forms of medium and we're going to shove it in this new interface and new experience and we're going to forget about gestures. We're going to forget about movement and we're going to forget about the real world and when we really do forget about the real world, that's really virtual reality. Thank you.